Hi there, my name is Linda. I'm a writer, video game narrative designer, general creative mess, and actual real life dragon. And I've recently been playing a lot of video games. I know, shocking. A combination of a lot of time at home and access to the Switch has led me to discover a lot of fun games, some of which have made new, precious additions to my hoard. Today I want to talk about two of those games. One of them is VA11 Hall A. I acquired this one ages ago in the before times in 2017, and it was love at first sight. The other game is something I was shown more recently, something that looked almost like my precious VI-11 Hall A, so of course I had to take a closer look. And that's how I found the Red Strings Club. These two are deceptively similar, and today I want to look at what makes them the similar, but much more interestingly, what creates the differences between the two. Biases first, though. I played Valhalla first. I loved it, and I adore it to this day, and the same can sadly not be said for the Red Strings Club. I was shown the Red Strings Club by a friend. I like it, and I think there's a lot there. It's an interesting game that has a lot on its mind, and executes most of those ideas really, really well. But I prefer Valhalla. I'm going to look at these two titles through a narrative and game design lens. I want to inspect their structure, their building blocks, and what impact that has on the player experience. However, I'm also doing this to have fun, and because I like writing and games, so take everything I say here as my view on these two texts, and feel free to create or incorporate it into your own. Whether you like or dislike either of these games, I hope these ideas can be food for thought. VA11 Hall A, or Valhalla, was developed by Sukaban Games based on a cyberpunk game jam entry. The tiny Venezuelan team liked their idea so much that they expanded on it and finally published the finished product in June 2016. Valhalla is, as the subtitle explains, a cyberpunk bartender action game. You play as Jill as she mans the eponymous bar, serving drinks to patrons and listening to their stories and lives. Valhalla is also a waifu game. I mean, look at this. This here is Jill, one of the most relatable video game protagonists I've ever met. She's a bisexual college graduate who runs from a job in the field she's graduated in, but is no longer sure she wants to pursue, breaks up with her girlfriend and becomes a bartender. She also talks to her cat for. Well, I'm just saying, I'd kidnap her. Valhalla's game loop is very simple and rigid, not changing much throughout the game. Each day in the bar, you pick a playlist of music from the jukebox. You mix drinks and change lives, and at the end of the day you go home, where you play on your phone, read the news, talk to your cat, and use your salary to buy nice things for Jill's apartment and pay rent. It's a cute game full of wonderfully diverse characters living their lives and sipping cool drinks in the shadow of a giant, all-controlling megacorporation because... cyberpunk. The Red Strings Club was Deconstruct Team's 28th or 2nd project, depending how you count. After a series of smaller games and game jams, Deconstruct Team was contacted by Devolver, who backed the small team to enable their release of Gods Will Be Watching, a point-and-click thriller that looks cool and is very difficult. Or so I've heard. I haven't played it. I have, however, played their second title, The Red Strings Club. Here too you play a bartender, Donovan, manning the counter of the eponymous bar. People come in and you mix them drinks with a shaker and ice, allowing you to tap into their emotions, influencing the information they give you as you talk to them, trying to learn about them, their lives and the world around you. It's engaging and makes you feel like a detective in a way I haven't experienced before in a video game. I actually spent a lot of time trying to remember what I already knew about the world, what questions I still needed answered, and what the character I was trying to talk to knew to help me with those questions. Also, the music and the art style are just fantastic. It's a very similar game to Valhalla when you look at the packaging. You became a bartender after a crisis in your life and are now an integral part of some small scrappy bar that draws interesting people and stories to it. It's a cyberpunk world, computer interfaces and implants are standard, and people use the vast selection of enhancements to customize and improve their lives. There's a super corporation looming over the city with probably nefarious plans, and you deal with customers both loyal and against this corporation. Which game was I talking about? Yeah, who knows. The pitch for these is deceptively similar. In fact, that's how I found out about the Red Strings Club. I described Valhalla to my friend, and they pointed me to Red Strings, saying that they seemed similar so I should play it. They couldn't have been more wrong. On the similar part, not the part where I should play Red Strings. That's what even made me write all of this, just how similar the pitch for these games is, and just how fundamentally different the outcome is. It's amazing! You stand behind a bar, 
You add ingredients to a glass and add ice or not, you shake them. You talk to people. Sometimes there are scenes outside of the bar. If you squint, it's the same game. But there are some small mechanical differences. And these design choices ripple out to create two games so different that comparing them feels like saying Skyrim and Spyro are the same game because they both have dragons in them. So, how do these differences show? Well, Valhalla is a community experience. Jill is at the nexus of a social web. Characters come and go, and sometimes they meet up in the bar, and she's a gecko on the wall that listens to their lives. It's about the people that you meet, about their lives, and why they're in your bar. And in some way, it's also about Jill. A substantial part of the game involves taking care of her, making sure she can afford rent and to buy the things that she wants to make her happy. It's an experience closer to Animal Crossing New Horizons rather than anything Blade Runner or Neuromancer. The Red Strings Club is something entirely different. First of all, there is a plot. Donovan serves drinks not only because it's his job, but because he has a goal, because he wants to achieve something. Donovan is an information broker on top of his job as a bartender, and as such, the people walking into the bar aren't just customers, they're resources. The casual accumulation of knowledge that naturally happens to the player when playing as Jill and Valhalla is now an active goal of the game in Red Strings. Donovan too sits at the center of a social web, but unlike Jill, he isn't part of the web, he is the spider. He collects information and passes it on when it serves his goal to protect those he loves. The mechanics of these games are so similar, and yet the experiences are so fundamentally different. It's like beach volleyball and volleyball, except that one of them is a fun game that you play with your friends and family on a holiday, while the other is a deeply competitive sport where winning is important and qualifying for the inter-school tournaments is what determines your worth to the school sport department. Experience freely invented. So, what are the differences between the games? Well, there's a lot. A lot, a lot even, when you start to include art and sound design, which I'm very much not qualified or comfortable talking about, so I'm gonna ignore it. But there are four main points that stuck out to me while playing, so those are what I want to look at. Specifically the number of characters. Both games by their nature as narrative experiences have a relatively big cast for an indie game. 21 characters in Valhalla and 18 in Red Strings. Doesn't seem all that big of a difference. However, several characters in the Red Strings Club aren't all that relevant to Donovan or the player. Donovan never meets them, and neither does Akara or Brandeis, the two other main characters that you play for shorter sections of the game. These background characters are less characters than they are the gardener who told the maid that the nanny had told her about the driver. They are the outer strings of the spiderweb, the ones Donovan never really interacts with himself. While some of those characters, like Francis, the resident programmer of Supercontinent LTD, can actually be spoken to and even has personality, he is hard to picture as more than a game mechanic, let alone a person. And even the people that actually come into Donovan's bar and talk to him, and are about as human as pixel art and dialogue can make them, aren't really people. At least not right now, and not to Donovan. Donovan has a mission, a plot to solve, and as an information broker, the customers in his bar are less people than they are file cabinets. He serves them drinks and asks them questions to learn as much as he can about Supercontinent, LTD, SPW, the MNA, and Akara. I swear, half of this game is unraveling all the techno jargon and acronyms that it uses. I was pretty glad I'd worked with game engines and source control before, so I at least understood what was going on most of the time. Meanwhile in Valhalla there are 21 named characters, and I remember every single one of them, although some of these also never step foot into the bar. Every single one has a unique design, speech takes, and personality. They have different opinions about the bar. Some are regulars, while others only drop by a select few times. And some of them are corkies. I think the two main reasons why this difference is here is because of a single design decision. Donovan is an information broker. He's a spider spinning a web of data. Every line of dialogue contains valuable information, if not about his goals and enemies, then about the customer and their state of mind, something that matters and can be exploited by the player in red strings. This actually beautifully solves a big problem in game writing and narrative design. Humans talk a lot, but few players like to read. So how do you make dialogue feel real and organic while also not boring the player to death? The red string solution? Every line of dialogue has value. Every sentence either tells you something about the corporation, about the plot you're investigating, or about the people involved in it. In line with this, almost every character you talk to is either an employee of Supercontinent LTD or part of the hacker organization Proxima opposing it. 
There are only two characters, apart from Donovan and Brandeis, who are not part of either of these groups, Irving the Third and Ghost, who are both little more than game mechanics, if I'm being honest. Irving can get you information out of someone by torturing them in case you missed your chance to get everything you wanted out of them earlier, and Ghost adds a new drink mixing mechanic by bringing Donovan new spirits. Meanwhile in Valhalla, characters ramble. They talk about their lives, their beliefs and opinions. Sometimes these discussions will tell you something new about the world, and sometimes they're just useless posturing. On the very first day you play, for example, the first two customers that come into the bar are incredibly rude and very unpleasant to serve. They talk shit about the bar and ramble endlessly about things that have clearly been on their mind but make no sense to Jill and are of little to no use to the player. This is some really clever writing as this sets up the next character that comes into the bar, say, as practically an angel. She's a sweet girl that became a police officer to protect and to help those around her. I mean, for God's sake, when Jill asks her for whether she's seen some shocking sights, Say describes how beautiful the city looked beneath her when she had to save someone from a skyscraper, or how mesmerizing an exploded water hydrant looked when it reflected in the shards of glass on the street. The two prior customers, who are all around assholes, prime the player for what kind of bar they are in and what kind of clientele they will be dealing with. So when Say comes by, it's overwhelming how good and sweet she is, immediately characterizing her and the two other customers in contrast to her. Say asks for a few drinks, asks for Jill's expertise in picking some of them, and is also the first character to really care about Jill's opinions and stories, allowing the player to learn about Jill as well. By giving the player nothing of value to gain from these characters but the entertainment of their stories, the player merges a little more with Jill, who loves working at the bar precisely because she enjoys listening to people, and it allows the player to simply sit back and listen themselves, rather than scouring every word the characters say for some hidden meaning or valuable tidbit of information. And that leads me straight to my next point. The Red Strength Club has a plot. Well, I wanted that to sound less dumb than that, but... Here we are. Valhalla doesn't have much of a plot. There are vignettes, small stories that play out inside the bar where people will meet and talk to each other or know each other. There is that one time an attack on a company happens and Say is in danger, and for a while you don't know whether she's alright. And then there's the backstories that get unraveled and revealed, but not much of a structure. Jill has no goals, no quest to complete from behind her counter. There are problems, don't get me wrong. The bar might close soon because it's not making enough money, Gillian, your co-worker, apparently has a sketchy past that might catch up to him soon, and Jill's own mistakes come into the bar to haunt her. But this is never the player's problem. The player doesn't know if there is a way to save the bar, and since you cannot move, there isn't all that much power you have over the world around you. All you can do is listen to the people that come into Valhalla, serve them drinks, and watch. Donovan, on the other hand, has an explicit goal. There's a problem to solve. Supercontinent LTD wants to release a patch to all their cybernetic users, which is around half the population of the city. This patch is called Social Psych Welfare, a program that will stimulate the body to eliminate all excessive negative emotions like depression, wrath and despair. And only Donovan and his hacker boyfriend Brandeis are there to stop it. And then things get even dicier once Donovan uncovers that the social psych welfare program is going to be spread through the mirror neuron algorithm that will get implant users to project the social psych welfare program through micro expressions and body language and affect even non-implanted people like Donovan. So there's a lot going on there. There's a plot, a problem to solve, a structure. This structure is embodied by Donovan's notebook, where he keeps notes on the drinks he serves, but mainly keeps track of the questions still left unanswered in all the information he has collected. These questions direct the player's approach to the characters that enter the bar. It makes them consider who it is, what position they hold, what they might know, and how that could answer the questions you still have left open. The presence of this to-do list completely reframes your interactions with your customers. It changes your approach from one of natural curiosity and service to something a lot more goal-driven and, depending on the customer, malicious. For example here with Naima. She's really robotic and uptight in the way she talks, and Donovan quickly senses that she's doing this to hide doubt and insecurity. You can then serve her a glass of stress or remorse to deepen those doubts and make her question whether the work she's doing is good. Speaking of serving drinks, my English teacher would be proud of these transitions. I love you, Miss Taylor. The drink mixing mechanic is probably one of the biggest mechanical differences between the two games, and one that best shows how subtle changes to mechanics can create completely different narratives. Red Strings is a goal-driven narrative, and so is the drink making process. 
Using the four to six bottles at your disposal, each labeled with an arrow, you direct your cursor to the desired emotion, shrinking the cursor with ice cubes, serving the drink once you've tapped into the emotion you think will make your guest most vulnerable to divulging the information you need, like with Naima earlier, or Larissa, a marketing executive you can spur into lust, ecstasy, or madness to make her unstable enough to let slip all kinds of useful information. As Donovan, you can tune into your guests' emotions, get them to drop their walls and be engulfed by whatever emotion you're tapping into. These emotions are not always positive. Donovan can make his guests drinks that make them feel overwhelmed by pride or happiness, but also despair, anxiety, stress, doubt or regret. You then ask them questions, serving them new drinks when you think that a different emotion would serve you better. The mechanics later get a little more complex when you have this little arrow you can turn with the spirits that Ghost brings you, or you can use a mixer to add more drink to the glass, but that doesn't change much. In a way, you're trying to brew an individualized Veritas serum for each customer, adjusting to their changing body chemistry on the fly. In Valhalla, the drink mixing mechanics are very similar to Red's drinks. There are six different ingredients right from the start, rather than the four you start with in Red's drinks, and slots to fill rather than a glass, but there are also ice cubes and a mixer. The main difference is that in Valhalla you create specific drinks customers ask for after a recipe like a brantini or a beer. Sometimes customers will however ask for a sweet drink or a non-alcoholic cheap drink and then it will be your pick what to serve. The drinks in Valhalla serve as dialogue options as the choices that in a telltale game will inform you that a character will remember this. Serving a character a drink they ordered, something they didn't order but needed, or the wrong drink will unlock different paths in a branching narrative and change how the story unfolds before you as well as the ending you'll finally get. For example, Virgilio here, a pretend philosopher and poet who orders a series of drinks in riddle form because he's a smug little tea stain. When you get all of the orders right, you unlock his ending where Jill and Virgilio eat curry together. Valhalla has seven endings in total and a bunch of different dialogue options, all unlocked by how well you take care of your customers and how well you know them when serving them. This is the difference I first noticed and the one that, together with the ones I already mentioned, I think most elegantly shows how small choices in a game can have a huge impact on the player experience. This mechanic is the main difference between Donovan and Jill as characters. It informs the entire feel of the game and is an essential part of creating each game's narrative experience. The main difference is this. In Valhalla, customers pay for their drinks. In the Red Strings Club, they don't. In Red Strings, the drinks are means to an end. They are a tool to get Donovan the information he needs. In Valhalla, these drinks are part of the architecture of the world. You get a good sense for how inflated the currency is, for example, by the prices of the drinks that you're selling to people. And they also remind you that Jill is just another of those people. They have to pay for their drinks, and Jill needs the money they pay to survive, to pay rent and to buy a mega Christmas tree. Valhalla the bar is threatening to go out of business, they're not making enough money. When I found out about that, I served most customers double drinks, as that would be twice as expensive. However, I made exceptions for people I liked, for Jill's friends. I had to seriously consider charging my friends more at some point, because my rent was due and nobody else had come to the bar the night before. I haven't talked about this yet, but Donovan has a superpower. This ability to tap into people's emotions. At first I thought it was some kind of AI, he addresses it by name and does a little chant to get it fired up at the beginning of the game. But then I learned that Proxima had infected him with some virus that meant he couldn't have implants. So it was some sort of superpower, something that not even the super smart robot Akira understood. Donovan is a protagonist, he's a special. Meanwhile Jill over here is just another person who needs to work and eat and pay rent. She's like you and me. All of these subtle and sometimes greater changes, the approach to character, to plot, the differences in the drink mixing and the money mechanic, all those things compound and combine to create two vastly different games. In the Red Strings Club, Donovan is a driven, opinionated character, an outsider to the cyberpunk world he lives in due to his lack of implants. He uses his skill with the drinks at his hand to manipulate people's emotions to make them as vulnerable as possible to his questions, to get as much information out of them as he can so that he and Brandeis can take down Supercontinent LTD. He's a spider at the center of his own web of red strings, harvesting information from everyone that gets caught in his web. In Valhalla, Jill is one of many characters you learn about and learn to love. She has problems like everyone else, heartaches and money problems and loneliness. She isn't a protagonist, doesn't have anything special about her, other than that she works in an interesting place with interesting people. It's a much calmer and much more lower stakes experience than Red Strings. 
and all these differences are created with a few subtle shifts in mechanics. By removing the money aspect from Red Strings, Donovan becomes an entirely different character from Jill. By giving Donovan explicit goals, the stakes in Red Strings are so much higher than in Valhalla, and the act of making drinks has so much more intent and, for me, maliciousness behind it. It's amazing how far these changes carry and how fundamentally different these two experiences are while mechanically being practically the same game. The Red Strings Club was one of my favorite finds of 2020. Most definitely not my favorite game, far from it to be honest, but that doesn't make it bad. It's a fantastic little adventure with a lot on its mind. It discusses autonomy, mental illness and medication. It looks at what makes up a person, whether suffering is part of us, and what we're willing to pay for being completely 100% ourselves, bad sides and all. It's really good and if you have some money to spare, you should play it. It's got a really cool art style, all kinds of representation, a groovy soundtrack and more food for thought than most sci-fi movies. But I have to say, I prefer Valhalla. I'm always here for media that isn't ashamed to be about people and characters. And Valhalla does that beautifully. It deals with everything that makes us human, with a cast of character that is unique, funny, sometimes absolute waifu material, and sometimes a talking corgi. I love it. And I'm really glad I get to talk about all the little things that make it what it is. So thanks Deconstruct Team for making a wonderful game that made me think, that put me into Donovan's shoes extremely well, forcing me to consider what information I already had on my hands and what information the person in my bar could provide me with. And a game that showed me by contrast what I loved so so much about this other gym that's been part of my horde for years now. And thanks Zuckerban Games for persevering despite the momentous challenge it must be to create out of an unstable country where your freedom to express yourself so beautifully isn't protected and isn't guaranteed. You've made one of my favorite games I've ever played, and I can't wait for the next one so that I can support you further.